We have Catherine now, so we can start. <laughs> so today we're going to do uh, skin, bone, and joint infections, and uh, also cover clinical aspects of tuberculosis. And hopefully drop a few exam questions. What's the largest organ in the body? Skin, skin right. And this shows the complexities of the skin. And as you know, the, what does the word epi mean from Latin? Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> means a pun, right? A pun. So that's a pun, the dermis, subcutaneous tissue. And overview of skin infections we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about pyodermis, which literally means pus in the skin some secondary bacterial infections. We're going to talk about the skin as a clue to systemic infection. They have skin signs are worth their weight in gold in diagnosing certain illnesses. We're going to talk about some, some infections in which you need to get a real doctor or surgeon to come in and help you out, infectious gangrene and things like that. And first, we'll talk about the pyodermas. How many of you have ever had impetigo? Okay, our cigarette smokers had impetigo, right? You're the smoker in the class, right? <laughs> oh, she's the smoker, you're not the smoker. Not me. Okay, what was impetigo like? You tell us what would it look like? That's common in children, as he was four years old. Note that. We're going to talk about, this is rare, we're going to talk about diseases that begin in hair follicles, the spectrum from folliculitis to furuncles to carbuncles. We're going to talk about a deeper infection, ecthyma, which penetrates down. We're going to talk about some spreading infections in the skin, erysipelas and cellulitis. These two terms are often used synonymous. In fact, this is a subset of this and erythrasma, which is uh, uncommon. And this just shows these, and this is in your handout, the layers of the skin. Impetigo, which he had when he was four, in which the ocean made him better, right? And a gratifying thing to treat, because it looked awful, but it's easy to treat because it's located in the superficial area of the skin, the stratum corneum. The skin can looked at, be looked at as an, as an organ of the body that makes keratin, right? It makes a single protein that defends us from all kinds of badnesses. Ecthyma penetrates down. And then erysipelas and cellulitis are these infections that spread through the dermis. And erysipelas is shown there as a superficial form of cellulitis, usually due to what organism? Can anybody know? Uh, good guess. was mentioned in uh, the first introductory lecture. Group A strep. Group A strep is the classic cause of erysipelas. And then necrotic tropical ulcer, you're probably not going to see much of here in, in, on the banks of the Congaree River. Necrotizing fasciitis and myositis are really bad infections uh, that are fortunately very uncommon. We're going to talk about Impetigo a little bit, the usual impetigo, non-bullous, is caused by strep pyogenes usually, group A strep, sometimes staph. Superficial infection, begins as a little blister, becomes crusted, and, and skin infections, uh, in, in, is for diagnosis in, in dermatology, you'll see this big rash like that, and the, the, the challenge is to look for the unit lesion. Try to find something isolated. Just like on a gram stain that we looked at the other day, you see all this stuff in the gram stain, try to find a single leukocyte somewhere on the periphery of all the, all the junk and see what's inside of that. Similarly, in the skin lesion, you want to try to find a unit lesion. What does the individual tree look like in this forest to grab the nature of, of what's uh, going on? It's an intraepidermal 
vesicular pustule, and it evolves into this sort of honey-colored crust that looks like it is just kind of stuck on. And indeed, you can scrub it off vigorously, which is why his parents took him to the beach and scrubbed his skin, and it kind of came off a little bit, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Sometimes staff artists, highly communicable. Little kids running around in the summer in Pitaigo. Here's some pictures of in Pitaigo. Uh, characteristic lesion. It looks a lot worse than it is. But this can lead to a complication called what? Excuse me? What immunologic complication can come from this? We talked about it the other day. It could lead to glomerulonephritis. It could lead to post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, certain strains of impetigo. And a pearl that we picked up when talking about strep the other day is that antibodies to DNA B might help you with a retrospective serologic diagnosis. Another pearl, which I think has been asked of students on examinations since time immemorial, or at least since the 1930s, is that if you look at impetigo and pharyngitis uh, caused by group A strep, glomerulonephritis can follow, can complicate either, but for some reason, rheumatic fever complicates strep throat, but does not complicate impetigo. Why? I have no idea. You got that? Streptococcal impetigo can lead to glomerulonephritis but does not lead to rheumatic fever. This, in the, this slide illus, uh, introduces the topic of bullous impetigo. By bulla, you mean a, a bleb that forms in the skin. Uh, you look at, uh, have you all had the nomenclature of skin, skin rashes yet? So you've had macule, papule vesicle pustule, you've had all that. And remember, a, a vesicle is a tiny blister and a bulla is a larger blister, right? So this would be a larger bulla that has ruptured. And bulla sympatigo, maybe 10% of cases, is essentially synonymous with staph, staphylococcus, staph aureus, certain types of staph aureus. Ecthyma, <clears throat> begins in the epidermis, but penetrates downward to cause a punched-out ulcer. Group A strep can be a cause of ecthyma. In my practice, I, ecthyma that I really worry about is mainly an uncommon disease, ecthyma gangrenosum. We'll talk about that in a minute. Come back to bullous impetigo, mainly newborns, about 10% of cases, caused by staph, and Exfoliative toxins explain the formation of the bullet. The staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. There's a lot about this in the New England Journal of Medicine about two weeks ago had a uh, complicated article talking about uh, the actual interactions at the molecular level explaining the staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, uh, pemphigus, and uh, bullous impetigo. Younger children, and it behaves like a burn, it behaves like a third degree burn. These large, flaccid bullae rupture, and what happens is you have these exfoliative toxins being released in, in uh, infants. I, don't, I wouldn't trouble yourself with this eponym, pemphigus neonatorum, or Ritter's disease, and cause epidemics in nurseries. So, that's rare. I've never been involved in such an epidemic, but it, it can happen. And this is a baby with a staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome showing bullous lesion. The cleavage plane really ripping off the uh, stratum corneum. So if you just rub the skin there in any way, the skin is going to separate, leaving the baby, of course, with severe fluid and electrolyte problems and and being vulnerable to uh, 
lots of systemic infections. Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. Any questions? Pass we now to another uh, disease, primarily staphylococcal, arising in hair follicles, and we have here from left to right, folliculitis, furunculosis, and the carbuncle. All of these begin in hair follicles. Folliculitis is common. All of us have it from time to time. Looks like a little zit. Uh, you might uh, have it in the bearded area of the skin or just about anywhere. A furuncle is a boil, usually about the size of a large marble, maybe a centimeter, centimeter and a half in greatest diameter. Whereas a carbuncle, uh, I don't fully understand carbuncles, but they tend to be deeper and sort of like a coalescence of furuncles, and this is one of the favorite sites for carbuncles, the nape of the neck. Folliculitis involves hair follicles. Papules evolve into pustules. Staph is the usual cause. Mark this well, Pseudomonas folliculitis from using a whirlpool. We talked about keeping a running list of certain bugs and the diseases that they call, so mark this well. Pseudomonas hanging out in the whirlpool, folliculitis. In hospitalized patients, sometimes candidiasis can present as folliculitis. In diabetic patients, malazesia furfur, usual cause of tinea versicolor, skin lesion, can do this. It's a fungus that has a characteristic spaghetti and meatballs appearance on a potassium hydroxide preparation. Furuncles or boils usually arise from folliculitis. It's essentially a staphylococcal disease. How many of you have had boils? Raise your hand. Nobody will admit it. <laughs> One timid hand on the back row. Now, some unfortunate individuals are smitten with boils. Who in the Hebrew Bible was smitten with boils? Who? Jo who said Job? Job said it, right, Job. Right. There's a condition called Job syndrome, which is a rare immunologic deficiency that you may have seen, uh, in which people begin with severe uh, staph infections early in childhood, but that's a different conversation than what we're having here. But the reason some people have boils is Unclear, but these people are invariably nasal carriers of staph. And uh, I see such folks from time to time. It's uh, why they get it is unclear. A few of them might be diabetics, but search for immunologic problems has been uh, unpromising so far. Predisposition is just unclear as to why some people get boils, but most of us, uh, over and over again, but most of us don't. And carbuncles are, are deeper than furuncles and tend to coalesce. Usually staph requires surgical drainage and can cause systemic symptoms. Am I going too fast? For you, I'm going too fast? What? No? A good pace? I told my students, by the way, I love suggestions about how to do these lectures differently, uh, uh, that I heard about something not too long ago called just-in-time teaching, uh, a different way to, to teach in which uh, instead of getting up here and sort of you know, giving you the, uh, presenting a PowerPoint lecture and with all the points and kind of dropping what might be on the exam and then you, I guess you'll probably average about an hour or two going over these, each of these lectures. Is that correct? And just in time teaching, what you would do would be we would assign you a textbook chapter or the handout plus a textbook chapter. And then you'd come in here, and then the hour would be spent in, as Q&A and case presentations, and then you'd be through. What do you think? 
Students didn't like it at first, but then afterwards they loved it. What do you think? Excuse me? You do it the night before. Would you come to class, though? But the idea would be that the teacher would be a facilitator, and after the end of that, you would, you would know it all cold. Excuse me? Kind of hard to do. You have to have a small group. Any questions about carbuncles? They're deeper, nasty carbuncles. There is an infection that you'll you'll see uh, on the wards. It's, it's not too common, but it it happens, and you need to know about this. Hydradenitis suppurativa. Hopefully, none of you have that. It presents is an uh, infection that begins in the glands in the armpit, usually can be in the groin, hydradenitis secretiva axillaris or inguinalis, and it's just a miserable thing to have to happen. So people who get little things that look like folliculitis in the armpits or the groin, they need to be treated aggressively early because once it becomes chronic and established, antibiotics are to little avail, and these folks often need skin grafting. You can imagine, to be skin grafted in your armpit, you'd have to be kind of splinted like that for a long time, so it's inconvenient to say the least for the graft to take, hydradenitis suppurativa. Pass we now to cellulitis, which is uh, fairly common. You'll see a, a lot of this. An acute spreading infection of the dermis. Erysipelas, as I mentioned, is a... Uh, superficial type of it. Most cases are due to staph and or strep. Erysipelas is virtually synonymous with group A strep, although other organisms can cause it. But in other cases of cellulitis, frequently both staph and strep will be involved. It's difficult to get good bacteriology on cellulitis. In a child, before uh, the Haemophilus influenza vaccine became universal, a facial cellulitis like this was commonly caused by Haemophilus influenzae, H. flu, the small pleomorphic gram-negative cacobacillus that we talked about earlier. This, this one was, uh, you know, the nondescript boundaries actually turned out to be Staphylococcus aureus. Frequently, it will appear around a wound. Uh, this would have been an IV site, for example, and here you see uh, this area of Cellulitis, and if you did a biopsy of that to get a good culture sample from the center, you might very well grow both staph and strep. Erysipelas is, uh, a, again, a type of cellulitis. Dramatic, spreads rapidly, usually caused by group A strep. Most commonly, the lower extremities, and uh, what you will see classically will be an area of redness that is uniform and sharply demarcated and accompanied by a little red streak that goes up to the groin where you'll find a tender regional lymph node. And the red streak represents what? What does that mark out for you? Excuse me? A what? The path, but what anatomic structure is it? Yeah, the, the lymphatics, which we, we're not even aware that we have lymphatics until something like this happens that marks them out for us, right? Lymphatics. And the problem with it is that uh, once this happens, uh, the lymphatics and also regional nodes get damaged by it. They get, they're never quite the same again, which means that you're prone to get it again. This is the reason that uh, radical mastectomies have fallen out of favor, uh, taking out all the lymph nodes for breast cancer, doing a radical dissection, because the people who had this done got lymphedema, uh, their arms would be swollen, and they would get, among the complications, they would get these recurrent streptococcal infections. And uh, this happens in people, particularly uh, 
very large people. Uh, uh, this is probably an occupational hazard of people who say have the body build of a football uh, you know, offensive lineman uh, tend to get uh, erysipelas. Uh, this would be uh, what erysipelas looks like, a, an infection that is, again, notice a clear demarcation between the involved and the uninvolved skin. This uniform pattern rapidly spreading. This was a patient I saw some years ago who had a belly button operation, a laparoscopic tubal ligation, and notice how this infection has spread very symmetrically in all directions with, again, this sharp demarcation between involved and uninvolved skin. And if you try to culture this, it'll probably be fruitless. You stick a needle in it and, uh, and aspirate, and, and you'll apt to be unrewarded. Uh, by it. Blood cultures are seldom positive, so defining it microbiologically is difficult. And my take on this process is that, is that the, uh, the streptococcal cell wall is a very intense uh, chemotactic st uh, stimulus for polymorphic nuclear leukocytes. So they, they rush in and cause this whopping inflammation, inflammatory response, and they get trapped in the tissue. So it will stay there and take a long time to, for it to inflammation to go down and it might even get worse for the first 24 hours or so of uh, antibiotic treatment. Erysipelas, facial erysipelas. Unusual causes of cellulitis, uh, and these are worth uh, memorizing. Aeromonas hydrophila. Hydrophila suggests water, right? Hydrophila, Aeromonas hydrophila, tends to cause a vicious cellulitis, complicating fresh water wounds. So I might give you on your exam someone who'd been water skiing in Lake Murray, lacerated his leg on a stump, and comes in with this tremendous bad cellulitis. Vibrio species, particularly Vibrio vulnificus, and that's one to remember for the books, a nasty cellulitis after a saltwater wound. So that fellow stepped from an oyster shell, shall we, shall we say. <clears throat> Who can tell me another <clears throat> classic syndrome that's <clears throat> apt to be on boards? The Vibrio vulnificus call, causes. Gives me a hint, someone who went to New Orleans and ate raw oysters. Excuse me? What? It can cause a good, that's good, it causes gastroenteritis, but more importantly, if you have cirrhosis and you eat raw oysters, it causes a bad septicemia, and which may <clears throat> include a nasty cellulitis. So if you have Cirrhosis of the liver, don't eat raw oysters. Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae is, I suppose, one for the boards. Fish handler's disease. We talked about earlier about, I showed a picture of H. flu, Haemophilus influenzae, causing cellulitis in young children. And the cryptococcus, a fungus that you had in Dr. DeSalvo's lecture, can cause cellulitis in immunocompromised people. This fellow was running through a swamp uh, trying to uh, get away from uh, his girlfriend's husband when he uh, fell on a stick and he came in with a nasty cellulitis that had to be opened up and explored. And sure enough, it was Aramonas hydrophila, my old friend. Erythrasma is a uh, common superficial infection, usually in the uh, genital crural area, the inguinal area. Men are obese who have diabetes, and a particular carotid bacterium is isolated. I'm not sure that, I'm not going to examine you on erythrasma. 
The skin is also can be uh, infected from other sources and things like the cuvitus ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers from sensory neuropathy, venous stasis ulcers become infected. And classically, these are infected by the normal flora that we reviewed the other day. And you'll have a combination of aerobic and anaerobic infections with the potential to go deep and involve the, uh, the bone, underlying bone. So uh, a little bit about that. And in immunocompromised people, obviously, you can get bad skin infections after trivial lesions. And these include some, some of the unusual fungi, mycobacteria, and so on. Any questions about skin infections? It's a topic that you're going to see a lot of, and you should know the causes of cellulitis cold. And you should know the association of group A strep and staph with cellulitis and other things, and you should know pseudomonas and whirlpools. You should know Aeromonas hydrophilus and Vibrio vulnificus. Pass we now to some deeper infections. Myositis is uncommon. Pyomyositis, pus in the muscle, is usually due to staph and is, is rare, uncommon in this country. Gas gangrene is clostridial myonecrosis, but other organisms can cause a myositis as well. It's indicated here. Aeromonas hydrophila, our friend, and non-clostridial crepitant myositis, anaerobic infections, and mixed infections, so that you have someone who's got a gas-forming infection, it might be something other than that. And I think we talked about necrotizing skin infections the other day, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit in the last lecture on infectious diseases emergencies. Septic arthritis. Joints are normally sterile. Septic arthritis. Infection of a joint. Uncommon in the general population, but becomes common if you've got rheumatoid arthritis in which the uh, joint becomes a place of least resistance, the locus minoris resistentiae, or a joint implant becomes common. And this can, of course, destroy the function of the joint and have some uh, mortality. Septic arthritis in the community, if, if one of you came in with a red-hot joint, it's usually a blood-borne infection. Could have, bacteria could have gotten from the wound. Can, of course, if you, it's, it's one of the problems of injecting steroids into joints. How many of you were athletes and got steroids injected into your joints? You were. What was your sport? Basketball? College level? Wow. And they gave you some steroids so you could play? in the state championship, right? Cool. Okay. We won't ask her what joint, et cetera, et cetera, whether it got infected, right? Excuse me? Didn't get infected. Did it help? Two years later, let me guess, knee, ankle. Golly. <laughs> Predisposing factors. Trauma. She, she, you played hurt, right? All right. <laughs> Trauma, endocrine disease, gynecocal arthritis, underlying uh, joint disease. Usually acute bacterial arthritis infects one joint, the knee most commonly, which is good because uh, I'm glad it wasn't I who injected her ankle because the ankle's kind of hard to, kind of a difficult target. That, can, that hurt, didn't it? Didn't feel too good. The knee's a lot easier. All of you will get pretty adept, I think, at injecting the knee, but other joints, I think, are pretty tough. Children, ankle and elbow, adults, and... Uh, Sometimes uh, people who inject drugs into themselves tend to get septic arthritis in unusual places, 
like the sacroiliac joints, the acromioclavicular joints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are some causes of uh, septic arthritis. Little children, H. flu, again, the H. flu vaccine may obviate that. A sexually active adult under 30, the first suspicion is the gonococcus. And that's huge, gonococcal arthritis. Staph in all age groups, the usual cause of rheumatoid arthritis, staph would be important in everyone. And I guess across the board, the most common problem. Mark this well, pseudomonas in an injecting drug user. Pseudomonas in an injecting drug user, say, who's got arthritis of the sternoclavicular joint or the symphysis pubis or the acromioclavicular joint, pseudomonas. Why would that be, anybody? Excuse me? Right, that, but why would it be pseudomonas? Excuse me? A pseudomonas is what we call, we, we called it, I might have used this phrase the other day, I can't remember, water bug. A water bug, pseudomonas likes to grow in water. You culture sinks, things like that, you have to grow pseudomonas. We mentioned the whirlpools, remember that, a whirlpool, right? So pseudomonas likes water, so it would be a source of it. You can also get pseudomonas, for example, in tomatoes and stuff. Uh, so when you're injecting drugs and you know, preparing the stuff, and you get a little tap water, you know, shoot up again, and you got pseudomonas in it. Chronic monoarticular arthritis, uh, TB, this is a list just to have sort of seen that uh, mycobacteria, nocardia, sporotrichosis, one of the fungi, brucella can do this. <clears throat> These do happen, but not, this is not a common problem. <clears throat> what about Lyme disease, Lyme disease and arthritis? You had Lyme disease in a lecture? So this would be strictly review. What? Is Lyme disease common in South Carolina? You think so? What? In the upstate? I think it's rare in South Carolina, despite all the publicity. I think it's very rare. It's mainly, if you look at it, it's the states that voted uh, Democratic in the last presidential election. <laughs> It's, it's, it's New England, California, Minnesota. They're the states that have Lyme disease. That's why they call them the, uh, the red states. No, they're the blue states, right? Seemed like, uh, that seems reversed to me. Democrats should be red and Republicans should be blue. What do you think? I'm a closet Democrat, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> Have to be in South Carolina, right? Viral arthritis. Viruses can cause arthritis. It's not a severe arthritis at all, but it, your joints can hurt. Uh, German measles, mumps, hepatitis B in the prodrome particularly, uh, and, and a lot of times when you have a symmetric arthritis or symmetric arthralgia and all your joints hurt, same on both sides of the body, suggests an immune complex disease, right? Circulating antigen antibody complexes, hence affecting you in a uniform way. And that happens with hepatitis B. Parvovirus B19, which in little children causes what? Fifth disease, and they're, in adults can cause arthritis with a rash, and the rash can be horrendous looking. It can look like measles, it can look like uh, disseminated sepsis, uh, and an arthritis can involve the upper or the lower extremities. Parvovirus B19, rash and arthritis in adults. What's your diagnosis here? Excuse me? Yeah, that's erythema chronicum, the bullseye rash. 
And if any of you have a patient with that, you'd want to photograph it for the record. At least 60 percent of cases of Lyme disease have that. And what you see often is people with Lyme, who think they have Lyme disease, have a positive serological test. One can develop uh, arthritis after certain infections due to, uh, probably due to immune complexes. And this tends to happen after certain gut infections, Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, so-called reactive arthritis. So a lot of these infections will seem to be biphasic. You'll have an abdominal infection, and then you will develop an arthritis afterwards, reactive arthritis. And you will see that, uh, really. Any questions so far? Osteomyelitis, or bone infections, are uh, uncommon, but you're going to see this for sure. They're hard to treat. Antibiotics don't get in the bone very well. And there are lots of different ways to look at these. The classic type would be a blood-borne infection, a hematogenous infection. They can also be secondary to a uh, contiguous infection, as we showed in that little homunculus after I quoted Psalms, my wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. If you ride a motorcycle and get hit on Garner's Ferry Road and have a tib-fib fracture, you'll probably wind up with osteomyelitis, which will be really nasty. And then osteo osteomyelitis with secondary to vascular insufficiency is essentially synonymous with osteomyelitis of the foot of patients with diabetes mellitus. Uh, normal bone is, is quite resistant to infection, but certain pathogens, especially staph, can it stick to bone. And staph has got this ability to survive inside of osteoblasts, and people can have relapses of osteomyelitis years later. I've seen it in World War II veterans up to 30 years later. So. Uh, it sets, you have to cure it, you have one shot at curing it. And this just goes into some basic biology. We'll, you don't want to hear this? No, not really. <laughs> the microbiology of staph, some organisms to memorize here. Salmonella, famously with sickle cell disease, all that's becoming less common. Salmonella and the pneumococcus. We mentioned the predisposition of sicklers to, I mean, to pneumococcal disease, streptococcus pneumoniae. The nemesis of implant surgeons, whether it's a heart surgeon putting in a prosthetic valve or a, an orthopedic surgeon putting in a, an artificial joint, is the coagulase negative staphylococcus. Why? Well, the organism is so ubiquitous, right? It's on the skin, staph epidermidis. All of us have it. So it's hard to have a completely sterile environment. Also, you have a foreign body in there, and, and also the organism produces a slime, in which instead of being like, uh, you know, one colony of an organism, you've got this sort of slime matrix with the organisms kind of embedded in it which doesn't behave uh, properly in terms of being able to zap it with an antibiotic. It's there, so you have to wind up removing the uh, hardware in most cases. So this really is the implant surgeon's nemesis, and the reason why, for example, in joint surgery, they talk about laminar flow and trying to keep the environment totally sterile, as well as giving prophylactic antibiotics. Across the board, aside from implant surgery and sickle cell disease, Staph aureus is the most common culprit in osteomyelitis. Hospital acquired, you'd worry about gram-negative rods, including pseudomonas. There's some other associations uh, for boards in life. You need to remember this critter, Pasturella multacida, from animal bites, particularly which animal? Excuse me? What animal? Pasturella multacida. Excuse me? What? What did you say in the back? Cows? 
How many people get bitten by cows every year? <laughs> I've never heard of anybody being bitten by a cow. I even spent a summer on a dairy farm. Came close. I heard it down here. Cats. And it turns out that uh, even lions and tigers, not just your usual house cat, have this as well. Pasture of animal bites, especially cats. Human bites are said to be the worst because of the mouth flora. Uh, human bites, there's a critter called Iconella carodens that can cause bites as well. Bartonella henselli, I'm not going to ask you about that. Somebody might along the way. Compromised patients can get just about anything. And we're going to talk in the TB lecture about tuberculosis causing it. Brucella, as part of brucellosis, can cause it in Q fever. Now, hematogenous osteomyelitis, uh, the, uh, the pathogenesis is uh, the, the story that I like to convey is you got this high school football player, and he's uh, in practice, and he gets hit. And he uh, he bumps his uh, his knee. He gets a little minor pointer, but it's able to play on Friday evening. And then uh, Saturday night, he uh, is getting ready for his big date, and he pops a zit. And about ten days later, he comes in, and his knee is very very. I mean, his hip is very hot and tender and swollen. And lo and behold, he has acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. And what happened to him was that uh, at the metaphyseal end of the diaphysis, where his epiphyseal plate would be there, the capillaries make little hairpin turns, right? Blood supply is tenuous. And so when he popped the zit, a few staff got into his bloodstream, and normally they would just whistle through his body, but when they found these damaged capillaries and the little small hematoma there, they said, whoop de do," and they began to multiply and infect his bone and he gets osteomyelitis. And that scenario is frequently you'll get this history of antecedent trauma. And what happened was he set up a locus minoris uh, resistentiae from that scenario. So most commonly in, in children and young people, prior to the fusion of the epiphyseal plates. Adults, older adults tend to get, because they you no longer have active growth and, and quite as active a capillary bed there, uh, the adults tend to get hematogenous osteomyelitis in the spine, vertebral osteomyelitis, which has been called an internist disease because it's, it's uh, tough to recognize. You have to fire a few neurons to diagnose it. Localize back pain, go up and down, Imaging, today's imaging tests, of course, are making this diagnosis and all sorts of other diagnoses a lot easier uh, than they once were. But staph, would, again, would be the most common cause. So staph aureus across the board, the most common cause of osteomyelitis, often a history of minor trauma, setting up a locus minoris resistentiae. Other pathogens, strep, especially neonates, salmonella, sickle cell disease, and pseudomonas, IV drug users that we've uh, mentioned. Vertebral, usually hematogenous, and it typically involves two adjacent uh, disc spaces, the anterior aspects of the vertebral bodies, I guess because of the, of the blood supply. with narrowing of the disc space as it approaches the front or anterior aspect there. And going up and down the back, you'll find localized tenderness. Osteo from a contiguous source of infection, typically a patient with diabetes. I'm sorry, thinking about vascular insufficiency. Trauma, surgery, bite wounds, puncture wounds, all of that I think is self-evident. There's a famous association again, two associations at the bottom that might be on your test. 
Pseudomonas aeruginosa and nail puncture wounds, typically in little kids who've been wearing sneakers, step on a nail, might be introduced from the sneaker because of the moisture there. And pasturella multocida with animal bites. This is a little kid who stepped on a nail and got osteomyelitis of his oscalsis of the heel bone. It's hard to treat. And vascular insufficiency, that's again associated with uh, diabetes and sensory polyneuropathy. They get skin ulcers.